Welcome. Happy Friday night. Let's get comfortable, shall we? In a few minutes and let people show up. Hope. Uh, 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 uh. There we go. Welcome, welcome. There we go. Oh, we might need the book, huh? Uh, right there. Much better. Hi, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Hello, welcome. You guys ready for part two? <laughs> Thank you. I think the likes definitely help the video. I'm going to have to make a playlist sooner or later, get them all in one place. And I should probably post on like Twitter and Instagram that I'm even doing this because that's a thing, right? Part one. Did you catch part one last week? I'm still a little bit sick, believe it or not. I'm like slowly getting better. One of my neighbors is learning trumpet. They're not that bad, actually. There we go. Let's see. I think we're about ready to start. Oh, I will not be reading the whole, um, the whole part two. Part one is pretty big. We'll see how many sections we do here. And like I said before, part two, technically, a whole new part. I don't think you really have to know much from part one. Part two, Jack Crow.
The only other humans in the cell had already passed through the dispenser, which was good. I couldn't afford to deal with their notions of justice and rights of life and the rest. Not that I disagreed with them necessarily, but now I just couldn't afford them. I got to the plate and stomped on it hard, holding my cone underneath the funnel. The purin slopped obscenely out, filling my cone and spattering me with dozens of little gray flecks. The same gray as the dispenser itself, the walls, the floor, the same color as me, covered with weeks and weeks of unwashed linsalt dust and rotten purin. I moved out of the line and sat down in a corner on my heels with my back to the wall. Like I always did at dinner time, I scraped my hands clean as best I could with what was left of my fingernails. This time, like the last dozen or so times before, I knew it was useless. The layers were now too deep. The lens salt, the purin, the stinking filth of the place were winning. Like all the other poor dumb bastards in there, my skin was giving it up to the gray. Welcome. But this time it was different. This time it was happening to me. I coughed or snorted. Maybe I snarled. Then I took a greasy lump of purin out of the cone with thumb and fingers and wedged it through my beard into my mouth so I would at least appear normal. The dwarf was next, shuffling along warily between two lindril, almost hidden by their towering gauntness. Their great height, almost three meters, made him seem even shorter. Their featureless gray bony faces made his face, all fat nose and bobbing whiskers, seem even more animated. He became frightened as he neared the plate. His head twisted from side to side to cover all movements. His eyes darted pitifully about their gray, dull, dust caked lids. He was a bundle of nerves as his cone was filled, so ready to bolt that the sound of the muddy stream erupting from the funnel made him jump. He should have been scared. In that nether world of Lindril giants and other madmen, he was the easy meat. And in prison, easy meat goes quickly. The dwarf's impossible attempts to see all sides at once increased after he had actually gotten the food. He stepped away from the plate and stood in the clear place beyond uncertainty, as if expecting an assault from everyone at once. But apparently no one wanted to go to the trouble. Today had been a full day and we were all too beat to care. All but me. I still watched the dwarf. I watched him gradually relax, begin to breathe again. And then I saw the greater weariness descend on him as he was again remembered that he would have to go through it all once again in three more hours. With his customary shuffle, he moved around the corner to his usual niche to eat. With a last glance at the others for any signs of pursuit, I stood up, went around the same corner, and killed him by driving my gray boot through his gray face and into the softer gray beyond. Red blood. I gathered up his cone before much could spill out. I had saved most of my portion, only pretending to eat before, and I took them both together for the maximum effect. Almost immediately, I felt stronger. Purin will last three hours and three hours only, but if you take more, say twice as much, you'll have six hours of strength for that time. Six hours of prison strength, that is, which was still only half as strong as I should normally feel. I shook my head. I had no time to enjoy. There was more to it. From its hook on the underway, I took the slab pike. Before I could never have lifted it, even now it was heavy. Carrying it across my shoulders, I stalked away through the dust. G had caught his foot pad in the belt that morning and would still be weak. Weak he was, but still no fool. He spotted the red glow to my eyes from the near double portion of Purin the instant I appeared. He stuck a paw pad against the wall and reared up to his full lindral height. Even in that dim chamber, his stature was awesome. Two steps closer and he recognized me. You, 
He had time to shout before I swung the full weight of the slab pike down atop his arch plate. G's eye cubes lost the glint of amused disgust they had held when first seeing an assault from the puny human. They became instantly opaque from the lindral pain response. He screamed that terrible scream. He clawed frantically at his foot pad, lost his balance, and fell against the wall. I was already on him, scrambling along his length, lunging forward. His throat was open wide, gasping for air. I wedged the barbed end of the slab pike deep into the passage, felt it lodge tightly. I bounced to my feet and threw my entire weight against the free end of the pike. The cartilage warped, split, then ripped. The screams peaked, ceased. Even with what G had already eaten, there was still twice as much remaining as I was accustomed to. My eyes blazed crimson through the settling dust cloud. Those who had come to watch faded quickly out of sight as the glow and my strength increased. Another pure and rage is on, they thought, and nobody wanted to be next. They were wrong. I was in no pure and fugue to kill blindly and gorge myself until dead or ruptured inside. I was going out. The salt four clamps gave easily to my newfound strength. But then I had trouble with the treads. Those few moments of futile fumbling drove me into such a rage that I finally grabbed up the salt bore itself by drill bit and casing respectively and threw it across the cell against the belt mechanism. I shoved the drill bit deep into the machinery, braced myself with feet and back and keyed the power. Sparks flew, metal shrieked, grinding against itself. The belt drivers began to buckle as the salt bore tore into its center. The wall shuddered, then the floor. My back felt like it was breaking from the force of the salt bore torquing against it. Something, probably my back, had to give, but I couldn't let go. I might never have another chance, another day, another life. My skin is turning gray, I shouted at the top of my lungs just as the belt drive and the supporting wall erupted. The salt bore casing saved me, shielding me from the flying debris. I shoved my way through the wreckage, hot metal and fused lens salt, and I was out. The brightness of the sun, of any sun, was a searing blow. It blinded me, staggered me. I almost didn't see the lumbering guard. Almost. Guards were twice human size with shell hides like rhinos and looked just like they were designed to be invincible but they had stalks for their eyes and i leaped up between those trunk-sized arms planted my knees on his chest and grabbing a stalk in each grimy fist yanked backwards with all my might it popped neatly out the guard swayed tripped righted itself those arms clamped around my back like falling girders as the third stalk undismayed by the streaming stumps at either side swung toward me I bit it. I plunged my teeth into it. I shook my head from side to side. I think I screamed. The eye ripped loose. The guard fell, fortunately backward. I disengaged myself from underneath his heavy paws and ran. I ran and ran, tears streaming with relief. I was not only out, I was free. Ahead at the port, the ship was there. It was, after all. The sounds I had heard from deep within the mine were not, as I had feared, only the product of desperate fantasies. I had to stop once. The taste of that bile the guards used for blood made me heave and heave again, but I was up and running again before my stomach had emptied completely out. I was out. I was free. It was a ship. It was a Borglund ship. Right. Section two. At first, I thought it was a standard coyote. Bad for me. Though there weren't any fleet warrants out on me, any captain who was only half bright would know enough to order me held for questioning. Then the whole mess of extradition would begin. 
different guards, different cages. But that looked pretty good at the time. Behind me, the Lindrill prison had come alive. Alarms, coated sound beacons, shouting, all could be heard. They kicked up huge clouds of dirt as they ran. With a last quick glance over my shoulder, I stepped up onto the ramp of the coyote and prepared to be arrested. There were two crewmen on ramp duty, a big one with white blonde hair and walrus mustache, and a short one with dark shiny hair and dark shiny eyes. The little one was going to be the problem, as the little ones usually are. Apparently lost in conversation, they hadn't noticed me. As soon as I was on their ramp, though, they perked up. The big one seemed appalled by my putrid coloring. The small one, on the other hand, displayed a grin of amused disgust. Good God, who the hell is that, said the blonde. You mean, what the hell is that, replied the shrimp. I figured groveling would do it. Kind sirs, I began plaintively, managing to both bow and scurry a few steps closer at the same time. Help me, I beg you. The shrimp didn't buy it. Hold it there, he said. Who are you, asked the blonde. I thought I caught a touch of sympathy in the blonde's voice. I turned all my attention to him. I'm a man of earth, same as you. I've been kept here by these. He's a damned escapee, Thor, snapped the short one. Look at him, he's covered with their salt. He's been in the prison mine. Thor frowned. They use a mine for a prison? Of course, idiot. This is Lindrill. How'd you break out, Earthman? The sneer he gave to Earthman was his first major mistake. There was an explosion in the mine. I found the way open. I simply ran without thinking. Then I saw your ship. Please, sir, I wailed, managing a few more steps toward them. You must take me aboard. You cannot leave me in this place. Like hell we can't. Move it, convict. You're stinking up our ship snarled the shrimp and took a menacing step down toward me. That was his second major mistake. Or the third, if you count his coming that step closer. But that last step gave me a much better view. This was no fleet coyote, not with a crewman as sloppy as this. His robe was dirty, unwashed. His hair needed a good shower. His tunic was frayed about the collar. No officer, any officer, would let such slovenliness get by, which left only one answer. There weren't any officers around to object. Mutiny, most likely. That, or outright theft. Whichever, this was no ship of fleet. This was a pirate ship. That changed everything. Thor eyed me for several moments in silence, then... I'm going to call Borglin, see if we can take him in. The shrimp was furious. Are you out of your mind? Why do you want to get involved in this? Uh-oh, look here. I knew we should have kicked him off. Both men looked past me at something. I knew what it had to be, but I turned around anyway. Reinforcements had arrived. An even dozen guards stood in a ragged semicircle at the base of the ramp. I shuddered. I had never seen that many of them all together at one time. One was enough. Damn, they were big. Monsters. They made no move from me up the ramp. They knew better. Awesome as they were to an unarmed prisoner, they were nothing against a starship. Almost anything aboard could be a monster eater. They simply stood there waiting. Thor took one look at them and stepped toward the interior of the hatch. I'm calling, he said. Don't be stupid, snapped the shrimp. Borglin doesn't want to be bothered with Lindrill affairs. Thor stopped, gestured at the line of guards. They can't do anything to us, he said calmly. Yeah, what about the rest of the planet? Besides, this guy's not worth the effort. Well, said Thor slowly, turning back to the hatch. I'm not giving him to them. You're crazy, Thor. What are we going to do with this gray scum, anyway? Scum, in my present condition, was too true to be funny, and his last major mistake. I took a couple of steps toward him and whispered so that Thor, just inside the hatch, couldn't hear. Listen to me, you slimy little pig, I croaked. I know why you don't want me on board. You're sick of being this ship shrimp. 
You're sick of knowing there isn't a man on board who couldn't rip your balls off and shove them up your nose. Thor may not have heard, but the shrimp sure did. His eyes all but bugged out. His face got red. His chest expanded. I thought he was going to explode right there. But he didn't. He waited till he got his stinger out of its strap. Then he flew at me down the ramp. The bastard was quick, very quick. Worse than that, he knew how to use a stinger. It may look like a club, but it's a whole lot more. Instant paralysis at best. I had to jump sideways to avoid his first lunge. I teetered at the edge of the ramp a moment before regaining balance, and out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the line of guards surge forward an eager step. I reminded myself that I'd be theirs on the ground. Not only did I have to win unarmed, but I had to do it only on the ramp. His second lunge was wild, but still too close. I felt the burning tingle as the stinger brushed past my cheek. I had to move. I fainted left, ducked another lunge, and slapped him twice on his left cheek. Slapping is better than fists and usually enrages enemies. The shrimp got so mad that his next swing of the stinger threw him off balance. I stepped in again as he fell to one knee. I blocked a hook at the wrist and slammed the butt of my palm under his chin. He squealed as his teeth cracked together. Then I backhanded him across the throat. He was tough. Even as he fell, he managed to graze my knee with a swipe from the stinger. The pain seared up and down my thigh. I bellowed like some animal and lost it. Maybe him personally, maybe the prison nightmare, maybe myself. Whatever it was, it was strong. I saw nothing, heard nothing, cared even less. Hate rode. I broke his arm, the arm that held the stinger, twice. Once across my knee, once by just stomping on it. He may have screamed then. He may have screamed all along, but I couldn't hear. I was too busy pulverizing his face and neck and chest and... And then it was over, and he lay there, half on and half off the ramp, covered with blood and gray limb salt. I stood over him, breathing heavily, until wham, and I was face down on the sun-scorched metal of the ramp. Thor had driven his foot halfway through my spine. I looked up at him, stunned, my head spinning, my back beginning to throb. He was looking at what was left of the shrimp. His eyes were wide, aghast. His chest heaved. You filthy, he blurted and kicked me again. He caught me just right, just under my left ear. I spun backward in midair into a full somersault and then crashed onto the other edge. Dimly, distantly, I saw the guards now directly beneath me and reaching up for me. I clawed scrambled my way onto the ramp. I got a knee up onto the edge. I heaved. Thor was waiting. I saw the black boot rear back, saw his weight shift, thought it finished. Hold it, shouted an incredibly deep and commanding voice. Everyone froze. I mean everyone. Thor, the guards, and me still clinging to the ramp with two bleeding hands and a knee. It took me a second to realize that there was no electronic speaker involved. It was simply the unamplified voice of Sar Borglin, chief mutineer and pirate command commanding. <coughs> a few breaths later, and all relaxed somewhat. And I, scared of everyone in sight, but especially the guards, scrambled all the way onto the safety ramp. The guards paused a moment, then resumed their ragged formation at the foot of the ramp. Orglin found out what was what in a hurry, a way he had. I told him some smoke about being Ben Lal, a missionary from the Church of Episcoblu to the heathen Lindrill. Lal had been a cellmate of mine, jailed, caged rather, for blasphemy, so I figured it was a pretty good story. Orglin didn't come near buying it. I thought he was going to toss me off right then. He would have too, I think, but Thor saved me. Thor didn't mean to. He meant just the opposite. He started sputtering furiously about poor little busted up prawn 
the shrimp lying there on the ramp. How I must have jumped him. How Prawn was only trying to help and this dirty scum jumped him. Seeing the stinger already unstrapped and out as well as knowing Prawn as he probably did made it easy for Borglin to see the lie in the ambush theory. Also, Borglin was irritated at Thor for butting in unasked. He didn't listen long. Then with a sharp shut up that made everybody's mouth close, he walked down and looked at me. Looking up from the position of a crumpled, wretched heap was no way to meet Borglin. To begin with, he was a real-life titan, well over two meters tall, with long dark brown hair and dark brown beard and a dark brown suntan face. He had a bulk to him that was, well, ridiculous. He was damn near as big as a lindral guard. In fact, everything about Borglin was big. His body, his voice, his appetites, his plans. There was something eerie about him, too. His eyes. In the midst of that great flat face of that huge forehead and forest of beard were the two most exquisitely beautiful blue eyes I have ever seen on a human creature. He was a handful. He peered at me, bent over with massive hands on muscular thighs and made a decision. Bring him, he said crisply. Thor started to speak, thought about it, Thought he would shut up and live instead, all in one brief half-second glance he got from the boss. But someone did object. A dry horse croak erupted from below. It was the warden from the prison cage on the scene at last. It seemed that everyone else was there as well. All the various penal assistants to the warden, most of the major civic officials, and quite a few spectators. The clearing at the foot of the ramp was a small field of long green robes fluttering in the breeze. The warden was lindral eloquent. He began by welcoming Borglin's seeds and promising prayers of virility. Borglin was silent. Only momentarily nonplussed, the warden continued. He spoke of the great gulf between stars, the greater gulf between beings. He talked about the further greatness of communication and said he knew that Borglin would agree. Borglin was silent. Now a little nervous, the warden went on about sovereignty, about different cultures and customs being included therein. The warden implied possible disfavor, lindral-wise, concerning breaches of that authority. He meant me, of course. When Borglin was silent about that, the warden stepped back. The call him major of the city, then stepped forward in his regal best. Gold trimmed his green robes. He carried a solid platinum hoop over a shoulder. The major was lindral tough. He threatened Borglin's ship. He threatened his men. He threatened his seeds. Lastly, he threatened himself. Borglin stood there a while in the ensuing tense silence, watching the lindral. Then he took one step forward toward the throng and pointed with a thick finger at the end of a thicker arm directly at the major and said, go away. And they went away. Every one of them. They didn't even have to think about it. An hour later in orbit, I stepped into the fresher. Two hours later, now out of orbit, I stepped out. Except for a couple of spots, I was no longer gray. I was pink, actually, like a pinched baby, but still better than gray. Borglin called me into the captain's stateroom after I had eaten. He was surprisingly courteous, asking me all about myself and commiserating about my prison time. I spent well over an hour inventing a past. It became a lot of fun and toward the end terribly convincing as I got into the role. Throughout, Borglin said little, merely nodding and agreeing, or even chuckling at some of the instant escapade from my use. And then, after all my lies and all my talk and all the work involved, he leaned back in his chair at last and said, with a sickening smile, Well, Jack, I'm glad you got, off, you got that off your chest. Now, do you want a job? So, he had known, all along he had known, that I was Jack Crow. Part three is only a few pages. 
When Borglund first gave me the deal, I thought he had lost it. The fear, the constant pressure had gotten to him. I thought his thinking is out. I was about half right. There was a lot of pressure involved and a hell of a lot of fear too for a man with his imagination. Never mind the mass murder of the officers. Actually stealing the coyote afterwards meant mutiny, the all-time favorite crime of the military mind. They do special things to mutineers. Not that I won't actually be ordered in for a trial, of course. The lucky arresting officer, meaning the captain of whichever ship might nab me, is quite given quite specific instructions to bring me into Militar. He paused and lit a cigarette, looking like a photographic smear on a 3D plate. Little white dart. I'll never see Militar, though. On the way, I'll have an accident. You want to hear about it? I know of one that took four days. I told him I didn't want to hear about it. Just as well, he said, puffing. Just as well. He drifted off for a bit, staring and puffing. No doubt remembering details of the four-day goof. But he handled it well, I thought. Damn well. Not an inch of trembling. Long, smooth, deep breaths. In fact, he showed no sign at all of being aware of his position in about the deepest hole there was. It was impressive the way he sat there smoking. So, he continued after a while, to the problem. He swiveled around in his seat, leaned across the captain's desk, and stared into my eyes. The problem is fuel. We are just about out. Uh-oh, I said. He stared harder at me, his eyebrows raised. Uh-oh? The man says, uh-oh? I describe what is quite possibly the most tenuous situation in the galaxy. That is all he has to say. Well, I suppose the prospect of a particularly nasty death at the hands of some lucky crew is nothing to the great and famous Jack Crow. The fact that I am being actively sought by every ship in fleet, most of which have forgotten the damn ant war and their eagerness to slice me apart, should be of at least passing interest, even to a man who moves stars. How did you so cleverly put it? Move stars the hell out of the way? Even to such a superman, my situation should rate just a little goddamn more than uh-oh. Care to try again? I said nothing, wincing, in fact, at the quotation. I had said something like it at the time, but I was pretty well frayed at the edges, and it infuriated me that that was the only thing I had said that the press wave people thought to broadcast. Show business. Nothing to add, eh? Continued Borglund. Very well. I suppose it was too much to ask to have you actually impressed with the gravity of the situation as it stands. So allow me, if you will, to try to bring it on home to you. I'm being hunted. I don't like it. I'm also running out of fuel and therefore running room. I don't like that. I will have fuel, Mr. Crow. I will obtain it. And unless you wish me to rip your limb from limb and then stuff you bodily through an access tube, you will help me obtain it. Is that pretty clear so far? I nodded. It was clear, all right. How nice we're communicating. Now, as to the how of it, the only Cangren power cell available to one in my position is at some fleet scientific colony, which are, as you may know, completely self-sufficient fuel-wise. My intention is to travel to one of these places, the remotest location available for obvious reasons, and make connection. Normally, of course, I could neither beg nor borrow such a fuel for a mutinous craft, and the possibility that I could simply take what I want from a fully self-contained project complex is essentially non-existent. As soon as I appeared overhead, they would simply button up the complex and that would be that. I doubt that even a fully loaded coyote could pierce their defenses without totally annihilating the can inside. So what to do? I will trick them, of course, or rather you will trick them. You, Jack Crow, will make yourself known to the members of the project. You will use your rather romantic no no notoriety to ingratiate yourself into the complex itself. 
and at the proper moment you will render it defenseless from the inside. Is that clear, Mr. Crow? Are we still communicating? Yeah. Wonderful. Now what, you might ask, is in it for you? What indeed, besides a grateful lack of excruciating pain, is your prize? Simple. I have an eight-man sled craft waiting for me in a safe place. If you do as I say, exactly as I say, you may have it. It will be yours, Mr. Crow, to wander about with as you will. There will also be an appropriate amount of credits logged into its banks directly from the treasury of this ship. I've checked the banks aboard, and it's quite a hefty sum. And if I can't make use of it, there's no reason why you should not. So, there is the proposition famous in Great Jack Crow. What shall it be? He was kidding, of course. Who really needs to choose between being rich and being dead? Between being anything and being dead. I've given your proposal considerable thought, I began. Good, good, he replied, nodding. And I've decided to join your little team. I'm so glad. Here's to the partnership, I said, lifting my brandy glass high. Oh, we can do better than that, he said with an uneasy smile. More quickly than I would have thought possible, he was up and out of his seat and around to my side of the desk. He held the flask in one hand. With an elaborate flourish, he filled my glass to the brim. Then, beckoning me to rise, he touched his glass to mine and gestured for me to toss it off in one gulp. I took a deep breath, placed it to my lips, and drank. It burned in my throat and in my mouth, and after a few seconds, in my stomach as well. But I was determined to give as good as I got. I closed my eyes to cap the streaming tears and to continue to swallow. And then I couldn't anymore. I couldn't drink, couldn't swallow, couldn't breathe. My throat was clamped tight by a monstrous rock-hewn vice that deflated my windpipe in an instant. In the next instant, I was rising slowly into the air where I simply hung. I opened bulging eyes and stared at the dead eyes of Borglin. He held me there at eye level to him with the grip of a single hand about my throat. A single hand. And there was no trembling, no effort involved that I could see. No hurry to put me down again. He simply stood there, peering darkly into my eyes and hanging me with a force from a single limb. Hanging me. Years later, he let me slowly down, but he kept his paw about my windpipe. This is how easy it is for me to kill. It is this simple, even for you. Remember this. Fear this. He stared for a little while longer. Then he let go. A crewman appeared from somewhere and led me to my cabin. I didn't see him for three days. I was glad. I stayed in my cabin as much as possible during the trip to Sanction. The crew made me nervous. It's not that I really feared them. There was no obvious reason for that. They simply made me nervous. They were scared, for one thing. Mutineers, after all. Every one of them. No way to ever go home again. No future to speak of in the conventional sense. And totally dependent on Borglin. And I got the definite impression that he hadn't let most of them in on his plans. As the days became weeks and on and on, the eagerness to know began to get to them. What they did, of course, was to compete in their efforts to appear unconcerned. Gruff voices, too loud laughter, elaborate guises of disinterest, all eventually gave way to collective jeering and anyone showing the slightest trace of uneasiness. And then the jeering became rougher, and the frustration now had an outlet, aggressive peer judgment. They were getting ugly. So I stayed in my cabin all the time except at meals. When I ate, I sat at the far end of the mess and appeared deaf to the too boisterous horseplay and the accompanying sounds of battered bodies smacking face down onto the bulkheads. No matter what, I never took sides, never hinted awareness, even when the Amazon drive tech bounced the little third-class sparks across the table and into the chair beside me. It had to happen, though, eventually. I had to know it would. 
I guess I had hoped Borglin had put me off limits. At last, somebody just had to know who the stranger was. Who are you, anyway? It was the Amazon. She was sitting at the far side of the mess, quaffing down the daily liquor supply with her cronies and generally showing how untouched she was by the grimness of a bad situation which could only get worse. I ignored her. Hey, you, at the end there, I'm talking to you. What I wanted to do was slide the plate into the chute right then and just walk out, but there was too much left to make it seem natural. And to appear to be running, that would have been asking for it. So I was stuck. Nothing to do but play it out slow, stalling all the way. I ignored her again. She stood up then, after a little mumbled urging from her mates, and came over to take it up personal. She sat down on the table less than an arm length, arm's length from my food. I'm talking to you. I looked up at her. Drive techs have to be big. During combat fire control procedures, they have to be able to lift whole modular assemblies out of the grid and replace them the same way, all within seconds. This one was about a head taller than me, weighing probably a third again more. I counted that and I countered her mood and I counted the strong possibility that she would feel like she had to show off a little with the others watching. I even counted her looks. It came up all bad. I continued to meet her gaze with a blank look. Who are you? She wanted to know. I appeared to think about it, said nobody, and went back to eating. I had hoped to sound innocuous enough that it would stick, but the audience at the far end wasn't having any. They laughed, not at me, but damn it all, with me, at her. I felt her tense uncomfortably beside me. Well, I can see that, she continued, but what's your name and what are you doing here? I looked at her again blankly as before. I shrugged, just along for the ride. A loud guffaw from the far end. I don't think he wants to tell you, Twala, somebody called. There was more laughter. That did it. I stood up, faced her. Maybe you ought to talk to Borglund, I suggested as calmly and reasonably as I could. But she was having none of that. Bullies worry about their public posture too much. I'm asking you, not him, she replied harshly. I looked deep into her eyes and saw nothing there but anticipation, and I remembered something somebody had once told me a long time ago. Bullies don't want to fight you. They don't want to fight at all. They simply want to beat you up. I can't hear you, she said when I hesitated. Then she took a long stout finger and prodded me in the right lung with it. Speak up. All right, I'm Jack Crow. Now move your finger while you still can. Now. She moved it, eyes wide at the sound of my name. There was a long, heavy pause while they took that in. I dropped my plate into the chute and walked out. Whew. I went to Borglin. Yes, he said distantly, regarding the ash of his cigarette. I did hear something about it. And? And it seems there is considerable interest. It seems Twala and her crowd have some doubt as to you having leveled with them. They're afraid you didn't. And? They wanted my confirmation. Well, I hope you gave it to them. Why, no, as a matter of fact, I said nothing at all. Damn it. Look, Borglin, I'm not part of your crew. I'm not one of them, and I want no part of them. Play your morale games with somebody else. Leave me out of it. Give me my meals in my room. Sorry, was all he would say. I slammed out there in a fury. I don't like being used. I don't like having my name, no matter how ridiculous it may become, being used. I didn't like Borglin or his ship or his crew or his problems, and I had no desire to make it easier for him. But that's just what I was going to have to do. Not enough for his purposes just to confirm that it was really me. No, much better to have to make me prove it. 
to make me do the Jack Crow pirate bit really drive the message home that Borglin isn't just wandering aimlessly, that he has big plans using big people, give the crew a little faith, and give me a lot of shit. There was no reason not to get it over with right away. I went straight to the mess, and on cue, Twala and Co. were there and waiting. I went straight to the mess hamper and grabbed a plate. Well, there you are, aren't you, Mr. Crow, if that's who you really are? I turned and faced her and wondered why this always sounds the same, always ends the same, always is the same. What is it? I asked impatiently, belligerently. She glanced briefly at her audience, then approached for me in three quips, quick steps. Why did you say you were Jack Crow before? Why not? Well, are you Jack Crow? Am I? Listen to me, you little skunk, she began, taking that last step into my airspace and towering over me. I think you're a liar. So? So I don't like liars. And then, with infinite weariness, I delivered perhaps the dumbest, most worthless line in all of human interaction. So what are you going to do about it? When she kicked at me, I smashed her instep. When she swung that massive arm, I broke it at the wrist and, for absolutely no good reason, at the bicep as well. And then, because I was sick to death of it all, I picked out the biggest loudmouth in the crowd and beat the living hell out of him. They all scattered then. It was left to me to take her to the medical for the cast and grow pack connections. Then somehow she was all arms and legs and hair and thighs more than anything else. I tried because I felt I should try something. She moaned and strained to make it better than it was, feeling at last that this was something missing in her, which might, it might very well have been. But on the other hand, that's another part of the legend which is wrong. So I held her for a while, or the other way around, nestled in those memories of surprising silkiness and warmth, feeling bad, feeling cheap, feeling that I would get Borglin back somehow. The gong sounded for sanction some hours later. We didn't move. She wasn't on and I knew we wouldn't land for hours. Then the klaxon hit, general quarters and red lights pulsing in the passageways. Everybody moved at once. I ran for the bridge, buttoning up. There we go. And yeah, it's kind of funny how this part is all broken up into little sections and the other one was like one big section. But I think I'm going to stop there. And make you guys wait for the rest of it. We'll have to come back next week. Here's some more of part two. What do you think of Jack Crow so far? Definitely piratey. Definitely some space pirate fun. I do feel like I'm losing my voice a little bit. <laughs> yep. I, you know, I don't even remember the next part of the story. Like, there's so much insane stuff that happens that I only remember bits and pieces of it. Yeah, I know it's crazy. It goes from the story about Felix and then it goes into Jack's story and like, it left me wondering for a long time. And they mentioned the ant wars that we, that Felix goes through. It's crazy.
still brutal. It's still like that brutal, like that prison, escaping from prison part. Right? That's what I'm saying. Like, I, I wonder if Jack Sparrow was at all based on Jack Crow. I don't know. That's my personal theory. Space Pirates. And I, I really like um, the anime Cowboy Bebop. And at some points... We haven't gotten to yet there are there are things that remind me of episodes of cowboy bebop where i'm like did they just straight up riff off of this book and like nobody knows so that's what i feel like like two, one or two episodes in particular fun stuff like i said yeah written in 1984 well published in 1984 who knows when he started Outlaw Star. I'll have to check that out. Um, what chapter did I end on? So, um, there's part one, and we just got into part two. Part two has different sections, and we just did um, the first five sections of part two, the first four sections. No, the first three sections. We didn't do four. So next time, I will start with section four of part two. If you're following along. And on my copy, I just finished page 112. So we're going to start on page 113. And I'm just going to throw the book. <laughs> I was slightly hungover last time. It was fun. It was good. The thing is, I should have eaten dinner. But I think I'm good now. I don't feel like drinking for like the rest of the year. <laughs> That's about how often I drink. Maybe less. I think it was like, I think it was only three shots of tequila. I don't even, I didn't even make it to four. I'm pretty cheap. But, oh yeah, I would, lo I would love to read more, but I feel like I'm pushing a little bit. I think I'm going to go do a hot bath. I don't know. I know I've done that on OnlyFans before, but I might just chillax and not not live stream my bath. I don't know. <laughs> Tomorrow shooting at home. You're welcome. Thank you for joining as usual. Thank you. work from home weekend. All right. And let's do this again next Friday. Try to do this on Fridays, 4 p.m. Pacific. You know. Not West Coast time here, babe. All right. Have a good night. Have fun. Happy Friday. <laughs>